remember when your tante or nana used to pick a little gully root chandelier and Santa Maria to fix that nagging chess goal? You ever wondered what makes this knowledge of local herbs different from that possessed by doctors who prescribe our medications? Hi, and welcome to another installment of Science for All, a program created by Mehurst to present the issues and developments in science and technology as it relates to our everyday lives. This week, Science for All examines what is required for the acceptance of our local knowledge of herbs and bush teas into mainstream medicine and pharmacy. So stay tuned and enjoy. I am a practicing medicine man. Um, the the Carinia or Carib word for a medicine man uh, or healer is a PI man. And it's a little joke with myself and friends. Some people pronounce it. When they hear they say PI man, they, you know, thinking of like um, a private investigator. I guess in a sense we are private investigators because we investigate people's illness. I was taught by quite a lot of people. My mother is one, my father who is dead now, and a lot of elderly relatives and so on. We had to do um, what we will call weeding or cleaning, but they will tell you what to uproot and what not to uproot. And you say, why not uproot that tree? And they'll say, okay, that's a uh, wonder of the world and that is good. Um, that is good for when somebody has boil and so on, that you make a thing, you know. Or they might tell you, that, um, no, do, do, the, that one there is zebra peak. That is it's bitter, but it's good for when somebody has um, fever or cold. And so you will learn in that way. If we are talking about herbal therapies, Caribbean style, we're talking about what the um, international scientific literature describes as ethnomedicines. We're talking about stuff which requires you're simply collecting or paying little or nothing for and then taking it to your kitchen and brewing it as teas. There are some people with this, uh, how should I say, thinking that, that it's something supernatural um, or black, if I may use the word black magic. Or Western people have embraced um, indigenous medicine, you know, but they have not, they have not embraced the method in which indigenous medicine is administered. If you were to come to me with a problem of kidney stone, I would ask you what symptoms, what you feel. And based on what you tell me, then I'll say yes, that it is, is it so? Then I would in turn go and get the herbs, the, the different roots, the roku root, um, the coconut root, the pea pool and so on, and boil it. And would tell you then how much to drink per day, the amount in, in, in a glass or, you know, how much time to drink it per day and how much. Um, and I, I, I'll tell you and how much days to drink it. I have learned through what I was taught and by people using it over the, the, the time period that I've been, that those dosage. And then within my mind, I will tell myself if it's a little child, the amount that I give the, the big person, I keep breaking it down based on the child. A modern day practitioner would tell you, take one gram or one milliliter or something, whatever. I'm just using that. Eh? And you feel more comfortable with it. You feel more comfortable with it. But a lot of indigenous medicine people say, take a cup of this. 
Now, two things could happen. Perhaps they write in their measurement, whatever it is, or they could overdose you, underdose you. You are likely to find people in the health sciences arena, I mean physicians and pharmacists, who know little about these herbs. They are likely to be cautious. I think a word like cautious is better rather than being opposed. The fact is the WHO, the World Health Organization, is in fact encouraging all member countries to get involved in showing respect for and a better understanding of the usages of their ethnomedicines. The role of the scientist here would be to ensure that not only is the herbal medicine itself safe, but that combination um, of such medicine with food or other drugs also is safe. So safety for me is a major concern. People are taking herbal medicines uh, and their physician doesn't know about it, then it can cause some, sometimes some serious problems. It may actually cause a, a prescription drug to stop working or it may actually potentiate it in a way. And uh, so therefore the medical profession really needs to be aware of, uh, of uh, herbal medicine uh, and the use of herbal medicine by uh, their patients. And uh, for this reason, many uh, medical schools have been introducing at least uh, some instruction on herbal medicine uh, into, their, into, into the syllabus. The uh, pharmacology unit of the University of the West Indies has uh, taken a, a, a great interest in uh, local uh, herbs uh, as a potential source of uh, new medicines um, because uh, there's, a, there's a, a tremendous uh, knowledge base within the area and I think it's really important to uh, look into the scientific uh, um, aspects of uh, why these things work if they do work. One also has to be careful about the possibility that, uh, of a placebo effect because the truth is if you take any person and, and, and take an interest in them, give them a drug, um, even sometimes with quite serious disorders they may show some transient benefit. In our own studies we've looked at the effects of uh, extracts of noni, methanol extracts of noni, on uh, the uh, development of the human leukemia cell line and we found actually that uh, noni extracts are effective in suppressing the growth of the human leukemia cell line. We've also looked at extracts of uh, mudder and found this is actually more potent than noni in suppressing uh, and killing human leukemia cell, uh, cells. Um, now that in itself seems quite exciting but one has to temper this with caution because you also have to know whether or not the drug um, is going to be toxic to normal cells and so that would require further investigations in whole animals. In other areas, um, uh, for example Dr. Ophir, Dr. Seaforth, they're looking at uh, various plant extracts for their effects on uh, blood sugar. Um, uh, hope, hoping that uh, if one finds uh, extracts which are effective in lowering blood sugar, these are potentially good drugs to be used in the treatment of diabetes. My research at the Anesthesia and Intensive Care Unit of the Faculty of Medical Sciences here um, involves the looking at the use of herbal medicine in patients who come to clinics or who are coming to theatres. What we really needed to find out was is whether or not people were using herbal medicines and whether or not this had any impact upon them. After that initial study, we looked at herbal medicine use at all the three hospitals in Trinidad. It's important because our patients could be using herbal medicines that could impact upon their anesthesia and surgery. For example, if patients were using things like ginkgo, which they use for Alzheimer's disease, this could actually impact upon their bleeding during surgery. And there are certainly cases of patients, case reports of patients having excessive bleeding after surgery because of that. So if it is we find out how much our patients are using, then we will then be able to manage our patients more effectively. We designed a questionnaire and in the questionnaire, other than getting some demographic information about patients, we then started to ask them about whether it is they use herbal medicines, whether they use bush cheese. We also asked about other alternative therapies that they may have used as well and we found that there was a very high incidence of herbal medicine use in the patients who were attending the clinics at 
Eric Williams Medical Sciences Complex, San Fernando and Port of Spain. The most commonly used herbal medicines were ginkgo, ginseng, garlic. In fact, garlic was very high use and it wasn't just whether or not patients use garlic in their normal foods. It was asking them specifically if they use garlic because they thought it was going to provide them health benefit. Now we really haven't investigated the effects of all these locally used bush teas and bush remedies that people use on patients in theatre and surgery and that's certainly one aspect that we can move into in terms of the research that we're doing. The acronym CARAPA stands for the Caribbean Association of um, Researchers and Herbal Practitioners. So it's an integrated organization where the scientists and the traditional healers or even the average person um, would become involved with it. The whole objective um, behind CARAPA is to integrate all these uh, various players in the in the development of a herbal industry. We are losing the folkloric knowledge about our bush teas and herbal medicine very fast. And we have a special and peculiar arrangement in a multi-ethnic, multicultural society like Trinidad and Tobago. And we shouldn't lose it, so we are documenting as much as we can, and we've been doing this over the years, for not just our own purposes in the Caribbean, but for the world at large. We will be holding seminars and herb fairs where they'll see the methods that are preferred for cultivating herbs, whether they're called Spanish thyme, shadow benny, whatever. They will also meet with people who make teas, that is processing the herbs, packaging the herbs, uh, people who make wines, people who make essential oils for aromatherapy, and they will learn some more about our bush. Most Caribbean people see our greenery as bush. They don't know the distinction between one plant and the other. So it will be general information for everyone, including the herbalists. We've just seen that there is an urgent need for scientific evaluations into the safety and effectiveness of local plants used for medicinal purposes. This is not only important for our individual use of herbs, but also critical for the development of a Caribbean herbal industry based on our region's rich tropical flora. India, Europe and the USA are well ahead of us. In the last 15 years, their research efforts have produced a wealth of scientific information on temperate and subtropical herbs. Information that supports and fuels the 40 billion US dollar market for herbal medicines in these countries alone. For additional resources on this episode or to post your comments, please visit us at www.nehurst.gov, that's G-O-V, T-T. I'm Maxine Williams. Thank you for viewing and see you next week for another edition of Science for All. Traditional healers now probably realize that they do have a role to play. They are playing the role anyway and we probably need to involve them in the process. And if it is, they become more aware of what the herbs do by doing studies, then they will now be better able to know what they can use, what they can't use and what may, may or may not pose a problem. I don't believe in putting my farm, my elders in homes and things because you lose so much when you put them away, home and away from home. That is closing the teacher out of the school. Where I think um, we come in um, is, is to establish the link between herbal practitioners and the uh, potential herbal market abroad um, because you need to have the scientific um, um, underpinning in order to make that possible. Mm -hmm.